Guatart. It's been around for years now, but it's slowly becoming the template of a silent evolution. Raspberry Pis have been there like forever. In fact, it's just seven years, but anyway. And they have sold like hotcakes since the beginning. Who owns a Raspberry Pi or has already used a Raspberry Pi in the audience? Of course, more than 90 million have already been sold to this day. We have all seen them working as a cheap alternative to a desktop computer, being, uh, helping children to get a taste of IT or help to automate things. But they can be more than that and less than that at the same time. Let's try to have a quick glimpse of that together today. By the way, thanks a lot for having me today in Lisbon for this part of my Mr. What If Tour 2019. My name is Bruno Verachten and I work for a French e-payment company named Worldline. I've been working in that very same IT company for 20 years. I'm a father of two. Um, these are not my kids. My wife would kill me if I used pics of kids in the presentation. And that's not my wife either. I don't want to get into trouble with her. So what do these two information, uh, 20 years in the same company, kids, have in common and have to do with the subject? Give me a minute. So since the beginning of my work in OneLine, I've worked in a transversal unit whose goal is to help our developers get better tools, frameworks, practices, whatever. The company has changed a lot in 20 years and my job too. So I've been working with tons of things, of course, 20 years. Uh, I tried the other day to list all the tools, technologies, projects I have worked with, and there are way too many. To make it super short, I've been working with Java on big servers, uh, worked on web frameworks, on device detection, thanks to user agents, then on mobile development, mostly Android and just a little bit of iOS. Then I worked on continuous integration for mobile development. I designed a virtual uh, Android device lab so that our users could then test their application after having finished building it with their continuous integration system. And more recently, a real Android device lab thanks to the OpenSF product. In the latest years, I've been tinkering with Docker quite a lot as it's useful and we don't have any more of those. But it works on my machine syndrome. So let me get to the point. Of course, most of the children are really interested in IT, computers, consoles, phones, and even development. The problem is when you are passionate about something, well, it's contagious. 20 years ago, I had 80 square meters at home filled of all computers waiting to be converted to Linux. Guess what? My wife got pissed and I can't have a bulky computer at home anymore. I had to get rid of everything. So if a new computer has to enter our home, it has to be blend into the landscape so that she can't spot it anymore. But my kids wanted to experience the IT. They wanted something they could play with, something they could program with, tinker with. And I wanted something running Linux, of course. I've been using it since 1992, I guess. So I, as I am cheap also, um, I needed something cheap. It was pretty hard to convince my wife, but I succeeded when I told her the computers would just disappear uh, into a drawer after kids finished using it. So we got two Raspberry Pis for the kids and the three of us started tinkering with them together. So Python programming for the Arduino, because they are also into Arduino, website creation, 3D design, but we are not allowed to have a 3D printer at home, of course, but we have some uh, at work. And we also got interested into gaming, of course, with the Raspberry Pi. So um, we were working quite a lot uh, with the Raspberry Pi at home. And in the company I work for, we host an IT conference with more than 600 attendees with six tracks. The tendency, as in every IT conference, is that the schedule drifts slowly because each talk exceeds the time allotted. So we do not have, as we have here, enough uh, staff to help the speakers to uh, meet the schedule. So after a few hours of the conference, it's a total mess. So a few years ago, we decided to use Raspberry Pi at the back of a display in each room so that the speaker and the audience uh, could see how much time the speaker had to wrap his talk up. Furthermore, it's not as stressful having something telling the time you still have as a staff member saying, cut it. So all of this was driven by Angular application and the Pi were just showing a web page as we have in here too. So with uh, data about the current talk, schedule contest, incentive uh, to post on Twitter and so on. 
So after the talks as a conference finished, I could not let this pieces of hardware stuck into a drawer until the following year. So I transformed one into a nifty mouseless desktop thanks to Ansible and Arc Linux, another one as a secret project, another one as a GitHub runner, and another one as another secret project, and another one as a um, provider server for the Android device farm. You get the idea. As soon as someone asked for a piece of software or a new feature, wanted to do test, dependency track, pen testing, my answer was always the same. Use Raspberry Pi, we have some. Can you see the beginning of a pattern now? Raspberry Pi at home, Raspberry Pi at work, Raspberry Pi just about anywhere. The Raspberry Pi is my common theme, the link, the glue, uh, the collision, the center of it all. Then, as I used Docker quite extensively, I had to try it on the Raspberry Pi, but we'll see that later on. You now know uh, the beginning of my love affair with the Raspberry Pi. In fact, it's not really a love affair, more of a love and hate relationship. The community of the Raspberry Pi is huge. There are too many projects to count. There are extensions, hats, cards, mezzanines a plenty, tons of Linux distribution, 3D uh, cases to print, USB handles, gizmos. We have everything with the Raspberry Pi. Is it why I can't stand it at some time? Or is it because it's vastly overrated? Uh, the official Linux distribution, for example, Raspberry is a 32-bit distro, as the latest Raspberry Pis are 64 bits, which is a shame, just because it addresses the all versions of the Raspberry Pi, even the Raspberry Pi Zero. And the processor is not powerful, the hardware is not that good, and it's not well designed either, regarding the USB bus, for example. So, furthermore, it's too expensive for the power it has. Maybe I hate it because when you try something, it just works. You don't have to tinkle with it. It works. Or is it because it's mainstream and hating something mainstream makes you the cool dude in the, t in the room? Or maybe just emotional contagion as some, on some parts of the internet, uh, some people just hate the Raspberry Pi. I don't know. So, Raspberry Pi and I, it's love, but tainted love. Now you know why I'm interested in Raspberry Pi. So today's subject is edge computing and IoT. It was Android device farm yesterday. It will be continuous integration tomorrow, and it could be anything in the following month. When the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But why am I interested in edge computing, IoT, and AI? A long time ago, in the last century, in fact, I finished my university training with a specialization in artificial intelligence. So it's a subject I'm really interested in, even if I have not been able to use it in the last 20 years. So yes, I'm pretty rusted. AI is not edge computing nor IoT, so why am I still interested in AI at the edge? Well, I have a use case. I am a permit. So what do I do as a hobby? I design systems that will take care of themselves after some time. Permaculture is a set of design principles centered around whole system thinking, simulating or directly utilizing the patterns and resilient features observed in natural ecosystems. So these systems are really efficient and mostly use low-tech, which I love, or no tech at all. In the latest years, I've been using high-tech as a spice, a catalyzer in low-tech system to give a high level of boost to something really simple. So to establish a garden, a farm, a neighborhood, a city, whatever, in permaculture, you need tons of plants. So I'm growing lots and lots and lots of plants, starting from seeds. So with greenhouses or polytunnels so that I can get the, uh, get the plants for cheap. Yes, I'm cheap. So this do, does not go very well with my day job as I travel quite a lot for work. I have there encountered multiple times dead plants when coming back, being because of uh, too much heat, too little water, surprise frost, too much water, or undesirable visitors. The first uh, enhancement would be using sensors and just reporting what's going on with the greenhouses. I did that. I could then be alerted with a notification on the smartphone when being 1,000 kilometers from home. Hey man, your plants are currently dying. Have a nice day. How frustrating. That's 
like the car used to tell you, hey man, your engine just encountered overheating, have a safe way home on foot. The next step could then be tracking the temperature change with Grafana, for example, before it's too late, but it's not much better in my opinion. You can see uh, before uh, the greenhouse, which is critical temperatures, that it's going to fail, uh, but you will at the end receive the stupid idiot light message. So of course, I could go full-fledged low-tech uh, by using window operated with phase change mineral works so that they will ventilate the greenhouse by themselves when the greenhouse reaches a certain temperature. But it doesn't take the wind into account. And it's too basic to really work efficiently for delicate seedlings. So the decision is taken when the temperature of the top part of the greenhouse reaches a certain level, which is not totally related to the temperature plants experienced at the bottom of the greenhouse. Furthermore, depending on the season, uh, opening too soon could make some plants ill or even kill them, as the temperature drop could be massive. I could also go low-tech with the heating or the watering of the plant, but are too many variables to take into account to have something really reliable. The next level of automation could be using Arduino or Raspberry Pi and just link efficient sensors to them. Write a simple algorithm to handle the temperature and the water. But there is not such a simple solution, in fact. You can do it, but there are so many variables that it would take years to develop. And each greenhouse is different because of its size, its materials, uh, its orientation, its momentum. So there would be a different algorithm for each greenhouse. So would there be a way to digest the crazy amount of data a greenhouse produces and apply a machine learning model on site so that it takes decisions by itself, being opening a door, watering plants, starting a heater, or sending an alert when somebody not being part of the plant care team is detected? Let's try to see that together. This is one of my use cases. I have over the one of my daily job, and I won't detail them here but just forget about my use case for the time being. I'm sure you have one that is way more relevant to your life. So, I've been telling you about IoT and edge computing without defining them. Let's agree on some definitions. So, the Internet of Things is a network of devices such as vehicles and home appliances that contain electronic sensor, software, actuators, and connectivity so that uh, they are able to connect, uh, interact, and exchange data. There are Bluetooth-enabled forks that will vibrate when you are eating too quickly. There are internet-connected umbrellas which will alert you if it's going to rain. And there are even smart toilet paper dispensers that can sense when you're running out of paper and will notify you via an app. Do you want your toaster to tweet when your toast is ready? We got you covered. But IoT is not a toaster, nor refrigerator. At its core, IoT is really just about sensing, controlling, and interacting with the outside world. So the first point is sensing. Data drives decisions. So whether dry soil needs irrigation or a freezer needs to be serviced, having better information about the physical world uh, around us can help us solve problems. A huge part of IoT uh, is about getting the information to the machines that need it to solve uh, the problems automatically. Most of the work in the IoT sensing space involves figuring out how to replace the human in the loop sensing, metering, and measuring uh, processes to replace them with automated ones. The second point is controlling. So once data points a machine into the right direction for a problem, the best outcome is often for automated processes to kick in to solve the problem. Sure, this can go horribly wrong uh, if the systems are not well designed, but the true reason on investment for more and better sensors is automated control. This could be as simple as turning on the sprinklers when the soil is dry, or as complicated as adjusting regional power grids to compensate for the loss of power because of clouds on top of the solar panel, for example. The third point now is interacting uh, with the objects. This is where the human gets back into the IoT loop. So whenever we provide information uh, to a machine or make an electronic decision uh, that will affect something physical, we are interacting with the Internet of Things. Edge computing now. 
So that brings memory and computing power closer to the location where it is needed. As Wikipedia says, it's a distributed computing paradigm in which computation is largely or completely performed on distributed device nodes. Edge computing pushes applications, data, and computing power away from centralized points to a location closer to the user. In fact, IDC research predicts that in three years from now, 45% of IoT-created data will be stored, processed, analyzed, and act upon close to or at the edge of the network. And over 6 billion devices will be connected to the edge computing network. This is way different from cloud computing, where the data, the images, are sent to the cloud to be processed, and an action is performed afterward. But why should we work at the edge? Why not use the cloud? It's a general tendency these days, but the first reason would be the latency and the bandwidth. So if your IoT is waiting for the answer of an API, you will have enough time to get into trouble. There are cases where the response time is really critical. Moreover, if you have tons of devices connected to the very same network trying to push data to the cloud, the effective bandwidth will be reduced. The second reason would be security and decentralization. Commercial servers are subject to attacks and hacks, of course. So if your edge computing device is not super easy to attack, then it will be harder for attackers to bring down an entire network of devices using a DDoS attack than with a centralized server. To counterbalance that, of course, badly protected IoT can then become zombie machines able to be part of a DDoS attack too. Third reason would be customization. Let's say that I run a factory that produces toys. It comprises 100 workstations, and to check the quality, I would need an image classification at each workstation. But each workstation has a different set of objects so that training one single classifier could not be the most effective way of classifying objects. So I could have several classifiers on the cloud, which would be expensive and I'm cheap. So, why not have a custom classifier for chip at each workstation? There are also other reasons like redundancy or cost effectiveness, but I won't detail it here. By the way, do you know you are already using machine learning at the edge every day with your smartphone? Security uh, with a fingerprint, predictive tasks, uh, voice assistant, face unlock, selfies, all of that is done with machine learning at the edge. So now that we have the definitions of IoT and edge computing, could we transform our Raspberry Pi into an edge computing node, an IoT series, or anything in between? Tens of thousands of people have made ledge blink thanks to Raspberry Pi. Lots of them have done way more ambitious projects like a self-driving robot, and new ideas and projects surface every day. Be it building a supercomputer by stacking Tons of SBCs, a Bitcoin miner, a brewery system, home automation, weather station, or any crazy idea. The only limit seems to be your imagination. Lots of competitors have appeared since then and somehow managed to follow the same recipe, which is stay cheap, use the ARM architecture, don't forget to add GPIO to interact with the outside world, and run Linux. Some of them keep the same pie suffix to show they're part of the same impulse, like the banana pie, the orange pie. Some others stay on the plant team, like the pine 64, and other play on other suffixes to be visible, like odroid, for example. The last ones have a personality of their own, like the beagle bow. Don't know why. So to do the same kind of things that we do with the raspberry pie, we could have chosen another fruit, like the orange, or a banana, a rose, apple, or another edible thin SBC like the potato, or something even less palatable like a pine cone, which is not dead. Whatever floats your boat, as long as the card supports a recent version of the Linux kernel, and who knows, maybe Docker, that could be interesting. There are lots of cards to choose from, so you have to make a list of your prerequisites before ordering one. How much memory will it need? 256 megabytes, four gigabytes, anything in between? Should it have a GPU, NPU, FPGA? What about the storage? Good old SD card, EMMC, M2. 
Should it have camera input, HDMI output? Nothing at all. And regarding the network, should there be fat ethernet, gigabit ethernet, Wi-Fi, LoRa, mobile broadband? Would you need USB? What about GPIO pin? How many would you need? Should you be able to use a real-time clock? Would you need it to be battery operated? What about the operating system? Linux, Android, anything more exotic? What about OTG? Would you need a very recent kernel or not? Would you need a specific hat, cap, mezzanine to extend the features of the card? Should be able to run Docker? There is no one size fits all in the SBCT, so you have to choose your weapon. Of course, these little bits can be used as servers. They run Linux after all, have fat ethernet or gigabit ethernet, and have plenty enough memory to run a web server, a small database, a weblog, a NAS server, a seed box, a home media server, or any kind of server, as long as the software you need is supported. The possibilities are endless. So we have all seen that. A blinking LED plugged into a breadboard linked to Raspberry Pi. That's almost the first mandatory step when you want to interact with the outside world. So the number of difficulties is quite high. I don't advise you to run your nuclear power plant with sensors plugged into Raspberry Pi, but having your own Raspberry drone sounds pretty cool. Lots of intermediate levels give instantaneous satisfaction, like home automation, for example. You can add a coolness factor by using trendy devices like the Eco, Google Home, Alexa, or you can even build your own Google Home, Alexa, uh, thanks to SBCs like the Raspberry Pi. Docker now. This has been quite a craze for years now. It's used almost everywhere and mostly on big x86 servers. I use it every day and must admit that it made my life easier as a developer because with Docker you can run the same software as you would without it but so much easier as all the configuration and the dependency hell have already been done for you. It will run the same way on your development laptop or any virtual machine or on your shiny and expensive server. You can also run several containers at the same time with Docker so that you can host different services at, on the same host without having interferences. So who has never experienced having dependencies clash when trying to host different services on the same host, hmm, me for sure. For some years, Docker has been only used on big x86 servers, but after Resin.io, which is now Berlina, uh, ported Docker to the ARM processor, everything changed. You could then have a running service on ARM without having to reinstall the whole system in case of an update. Rollback is much easier when using Docker, so you can now use Docker on your new big ARM server. Speaking of ARM and Docker, you are not limited to the biggest ARM servers to use it. Even the Raspberry Pi can use Docker. By the way, Ypriot ARM Linux distribution has made Docker on ARM its main selling point. From burning the image on an SD card to running the first Docker container in five to 10 minutes is for real and not just a charming promise. It even exists in 64 bits for the latest uh, evolutions of the Raspberry Pi. For other cards like the Range Pi Zero, which I have that here, you can use Armbian, which makes the installation of Docker a breeze. That's pretty cool to be able to run Docker on that kind of mini machines, but what kind of service can you run with so little memory? Well, tons of things. Believe it or not, you can transform your Raspberry Pi into a GitLab runner to ease your continuous integration process or into a web server, a database, a blog. As without Docker, the possibilities are endless. So we have seen that we can make tons of funny and interesting projects with the Raspberry Pi and its competitors. Use them as servers, interact with them thanks to the GPIO or hats, and even use Docker, which will help us get out of the dependency hell. All thanks to top-notch recent distributions like Ambion or Ypriot. Now what? What if we could somehow combine that? plug everything together. What if we could get the best of both worlds, a blinking LED controlled by a Docker container? Okay, this may not be the best use case, but you get the idea. As soon as you think of what you could do uh, if you could control from within Docker what's going on with a GPIO, 
IDs will pop up by themselves because yes, you can control the DPIO through Docker. You can prepare ahead of time an image containing everything you need. You can break it as many times as necessary until it works fine and then deploy it on an innocent machine which is linked to a piece of hardware without having to tinkle with the machine configuration. Like for example, a sensor connected to Raspberry Pi ready to be read through Docker. There are several ways to do it. You can choose your favorite GPIO library and create your own Docker image with it, or you can use a pre-made Docker image containing a GPIO library. Afterwards, you just have to run the Docker image while not forgetting to link a GPIO to the Docker image, which would get something like this. It doesn't get much easier than that. So being able to interact with a sensor, a hat, or any hardware plugged into the GPIO is a major step. If we could add on top of that, capturing images through the CSI camera with Docker, that would be the raspberry on the cake. Is it even possible? Yes, it is. You have access to the CSI camera from Docker. You can access it, and there are even Docker images ready to be used uh, that will launch a web server serving the video and that will open a port with the video streaming. You just have to link the right device to your Docker container or run it as a privileged container. That's a nice step in the right direction. So, what do we have now? A Docker-able ARM machine ready to be used as a server that can interact with the outside world. It can make some heavy computation or even AI based on the data it gathers from the sensors or the camera that we now can do anomaly detection or forecast. You can also report on specific hardware, for example, like a lava lamp for fail build or a Google Home notification message. That's interesting, but can we do any better? With this configuration, we still need to use a power plug, Ethernet, or Wi-Fi so that we're not really on the edge of anything. Could we simplify or make the device more independent? Some devices can handle power over Ethernet natively with little hacks or hats so that you could get rid of the power plug and let them, let them operate just about anywhere as long as you've got Ethernet nearby. We still have to be next to a plug of some sort. What if we remove the power adapter limitation? The Pi Juice, for example, could be the solution if coupled to a solar panel or any other solution that does not depend on the grid. For other SBCs, uh, there are other solutions, but most of the time it looks almost the same. It's a mezzanine of some sort hosting a battery on top of the main card. So we are not far from happiness. No more wires for power, and we could get rid of the Ethernet cable too, but we still depend on Wi-Fi, which may not be convenient depending on the location of the device. So one last upgrade to the device on the edge could be the use of LoRa. So this technology allows very long range transmission, uh, supposedly like 15 kilometers in an open field. So with low power consumption. Of course, you have to be able to get in touch with the LoRa gateway in that range and the data range is not super exciting. It's 27 kilobit per second at most and you're not allowed to occupy the bandwidth all the time. So it won't be the answer to all your questions about using a Docker able ARM device on the edge without any access to the grid. It will never allow you to send uh, pictures taken by the camera, for example, but you could send results about what it found in the pictures. Your sensors, devices, motors, sprinklers, whatever, equipped with LoRaWAN will send data to the gateway they can reach, and these gateways will send this data to an application server, which will then get in touch with your code, thanks to HTTP or MQTT, for example, that knows what to do with this piece of data. But is there a way to use LoRa easily with a Raspberry Pi? Yes, indeed. You can find hats to transform your Raspberry Pi into a LoRa thing, even the latest uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. So you can transform your Raspi into somehow LoRa getaway with that very same call or spend more money and have a full-fledged getaway instead. Now we are talking. We have a low power of the grid, ARM device running Docker and able to interact with the outside world while exchanging data with the rest of the internet and the LoRa devices around it. That's not bad. But is that really computing at the edge? I think it is a nice blend of IoT and edge computing. 
but why should we bother with LoRa? Couldn't we use directly mobile broadband uh, on the SBC? Of course you can. Some USB keys that provide GSM connectivity are handled by Linux on Raspberry. Some SBCs have mezzanines with SIM card slots so that you can get network this way too. Some other cards have a SIM card slot and lots of other gimmicks too so that you could start sending your data on the internet just after unboxing your card. But will there be a good 4G connection where your device will be located? And are you ready to pay each month a fair amount of money uh, for your IoT device to get access to the internet? And what about it getting stolen? So why not getting a cheaper subscription and just send text messages? 2G is widely available after all, even in the countryside. But you would have then to be able to catch the messages on the other hand so that you're able to process them. So that means another card at home or at work with another mobile broadband subscription and tons of headaches. Another drawback of using a mobile broadband is a power consumption. Sending an SMS is way more energy consuming than sending the same message with LoRaWAN. Using LoRaWAN is just a matter of finding the right card, hat, USB key, and being part of the right network. But once it's done, you won't have to pay each month to get LoRa on your connected part of the world. That's free. LoRa One Getaways are there for you, forwarding your packets to your application server automagically. You already got it. I'm cheap. And LoRa has been designed to be as cheap as possible. So cheap, in fact, that you could get LoRa able sensors for very little money. These sensors could send your LoRa Getaway able SBC data. Uh, that it could then process and forward through the core network to your application server. It's so cheap, dependable, and disposable that even cows get some. I know we are not sheep nor cows, but if cows can get some, we should too, but maybe not on our ears, but in our cities. So what do we have now? Another grid SBC able to process some data to interact with the outside world by using sensors, cameras, or maybe even engaging mechanisms, starting motors, and even being able to get and send back data to your application server. We could have several of them acting as end nodes, processing images, sensor data, taking decisions or drawing conclusions, and sending back data to others acting as getaways. Now what? We have seen earlier that the Raspberry Pi could be used for AI with TensorFlow. Of course, there is also a Docker image for that. So could we use our out of the grid, somehow internet linked, Docker able SBC to process the data coming from the edge of the real world? Yes, we can. First of all, you have to train a model in the cloud or on premises, and then you will be able to run it on the Raspberry Pi or on any SBC able to run Docker. You can, of course, use some more powerful boards like the one with the Rockship 3399 to get more accurate or faster results, but you can do even better. You can also add hats uh, to SBC that will bring powerful inference for models in areas such as predictive maintenance, anomaly detections, robotics, and many more. You can find hybrid boards with programmable logic FPGA that are able to do much better than only with a CPU. For example, this one is able to process 69 images per second compared to a good CPU which will only do two per second. On the other hand, you also have cheaper and more specialized boards like bundled with a camera that can do some image recognition, for example, thanks to a specialized ARM library. You also have cameras that support the same socks as some SBCs with AI extension chips called NPU like the Rockship 3399 Pro. So the Pro is like the original, except for the addition of an up to 3.0 TOPS performing neural network processing unit, NPU. This NPU supports TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, CAFE, and other deep learning models. So as I said before, machine learning development is done in two stages. As for TensorFlow on the Raspi, an algorithm is initially trained on a big set of sample data on a powerful machine or on a cluster. Then the trained network is deployed into an application that needs to interpret real data. 
So this deployment stage or inference stage is where edge computing is really useful. For this kind of board, you have an intermediary step which will convert the train model into something which is understandable by the NPU, the specific chip for deploying. Now, let's say that you have an aging SBC, which is good at taking pics or getting sensors data, but which fails at inference because it has a poor performance, like the Raspberry Pi 2, for example. So you want to keep it because the time you invested on it is quite high, and you don't want to invest into another one and redo everything. So what if there was a way uh, to run something at the edge of your edge computing device could we call that uh, dangling on the edge computing? Just kidding, so not at the edge of the edge device, but what if we could delegate the work to a specialized piece of hardware that we could link to that aging SBC? This USB stick is a RangePy AI stick that supports CAFE, PyTorch, and soon TensorFlow. It can achieve up to 5.6 tops, almost twice as good as the RK3399 Pro. Uh, that's a pretty little uh, impressive uh, piece of hardware. Google has another proposal. It proposes to make any Linux or Android Thing machines or even the Raspberry Pi AI able thanks to their Edge TPU machine learning chip, this one. You have to plug it in, use a dev kit, and you will process machine learning inference data directly on the device. This chip is a stripped down version of the one Google uses to train machine learning models in the cloud. So of course, you will have to train your model in the cloud beforehand with some sample data, but that opens quite a lot of opportunities for low-end devices located at the edge. So we have seen that we could use SBCs like the Raspberry Pi to do edge computing, machine learning, and interact with the outside world. That's nice, but what if we could do that with something more powerful? So powerful, in fact, that you could use virtual machines on top of it. So VMware made an announcement last August about their ESXi product. So it's a purpose-built bare metal hypervisor that installs directly onto a physical server. With direct access and control of underlying resources, ESXi is more efficient than hosted architectures and can effectively partition hardware to increase consolidation ratios and even cut costs. So their ESXi will now support ARM processors or a few implementations of the ARM processor like the Marvel Armada 8040. Um, and VMware precise it was designed to run at the edge and not in the server rooms. So for the example, the server was running in a wind turbine. So I don't know what kind of uh, data this was gathering and how but USB and SDIO 3.0 are supported on the Armada 8040. So we could imagine sensors, cameras, or any USB uh, devices plugged into that card. So to me, it makes sense to have ESXi on the edge. It's always safer and easier to push a new VM rather than to flash a new version of a firmware. So let's hope for other socks supported by VMware so that interesting and affordable, as I'm cheap, boards can be used to pop ARM VM running Docker and do AI on the edge. Speaking of affordable, uh, since then a big part of ESXi has been ported to the Raspberry Pi so that we now have ESX Pi. So does it make sense on such a tiny platform? Not at all. <laughs> or more precisely, uh, not really on, not yet. For the time being, it allows ESXi developers to get bugs out of their code and uh, push it down to the x86 platform afterwards. So today, VMware is clearly positioned in standby for the IoT. So IoT getaways are one of the future use cases that focuses some of the attention. So in a few years from now, uh, we get that in our homes, in our companies, there will be hubs grouping management interfaces of most connected objects. It would be some kind of uh, virtual architecture that would free developers uh, from hardware constraints while concentrating and isolating these modules on a single platform, like what we know today about server virtualization. Now, what if we used exotic uh, pieces of hardware, like an Ethernet switch or a TV box? In fact, at work or at home, we are already next to tons of ARM-powered hardware. 
So this particular piece of hardware is a clear fog router uh, with a very powerful SOC and six Ethernet plugs. So why not use that with Docker to provide network to lower end devices that would be linked to sensors? So I know it's a router and not supposed to run Docker, but I don't care. It's kind of pricey, but Ypriot OS is already running on this beast, so it would work out of the box. Uh, but let's keep focused. We wanted something cheap. There are tons of cheap TV boxes on Amazon, AliExpress, Dilextreme, and so on. Some of them are sporting a powerful SOC, have lots of ports, and can run Armbian for the price of the Raspberry Pi. So for 35 euros, you get a working TV box with its power supply, running Android TV, and able to run Armbian. That's super cool. So I'm currently investigating this field, but that's not a plug and play solution. Sometimes the GPIO is not soldered, so that you have to do it by yourself. Most of the time there is no GPIO at all, so this card won't help us uh, in that matter. So I don't expect to have a complete solution with a TV box soon, but that keeps being interesting for me. Now, do you remember my use case at the beginning? So greenhouses, plants, sensors, AI on the edge. So am I done with that? Did I succeed in it? Does it work? So Docker works on my machines. Uh, TensorFlow works within Docker. I have access to LoRa sensors and getaways. But the most difficult part uh, is getting everything off the grid. I tried with a solar panel and a power bank, then more sophisticated systems. But for the time being, I have not been able to find a very good solution for very little money. Of course, you can make it work for cheap, but that's not a long-term solution. So this is a picture of an SBC running a website of the grid, and there are quite a few parts that cost a lot of money. The second problem I have is creating the right model with TensorFlow. Of course, I have a huge load of data coming my way continuously from the greenhouses, but there is no automated way to say, this is a case where you should have opened the door, this is a case where you should have watered the plants, and so on. But until I manage to solve that, I can still use another model and have my SBC tell me that it sported a cat, a mouse, a raccoon, or a human being uh, next to the greenhouses. To conclude, if you're interested in machine learning and already have a Raspberry Pi gathering dust or stuck in your pocket, wait no more. You will find tons of tutorials for this card, but you can also follow more general introduction to machine learning. If you don't own a Raspberry Pi yet, you could buy an even cheaper card like the Orange Pi 1, which starts at 9 euros and starts playing with TensorFlow in Docker or OpenCV. Yes, you can start machine learning and edge computing for 9 euros. If you just want to start interacting with the outside world without machine learning, that's perfect too. So if you're using the Raspberry Pi, you'll find the biggest community that will help you progress. And if you choose another card, well, you'll have tons of fun chasing the little gremlins. And by doing that, you will learn a lot and deserve a cold brew afterward. The only rules, after all, are just having fun and learning on day. And the only limits are your imagination and the memory, the USB downgrade, um, the SD card performance, and so on. Thanks a lot for your attention.